Yeah, howdy. So I'm Joshua from uh, Sanity's Cove, and perhaps you're in a discussion if you're a Christian and uh, you want to get to know what the Scripture says, because as a Christian, that's important to you. And so you study the Bible, you do your research, you, you get the background, you check the commentaries on, on any given issue, and you come in and you say, hey, I think this is what the Bible says. And the person who's discussing with you, they, they have a difference of opinion. And they say something along the lines of, oh, well, it's all good and right that the Bible says that. And of course, we respect the Bible, but, uh, you know, the Bible also, it supports slavery. And uh, of course, now in the 21st century, uh, uh, we've come to an agreement, certainly as, as Christians, we can all agree that slavery is wrong. So even though the New Testament supports slavery, um, we, we know that's incorrect. And that's a, a part of the Bible we've left behind us. So, so maybe this uh, other issue that you're now all excited about and so confident about what the Bible says, what it doesn't say, I, it, it may be like that. And of course, if you hear something like that, it's just... It's really a bit of a discussion killer, isn't it? Uh, it, it totally takes away your confidence in, in, in the Bible. And, and it can be very confusing. Right? Well, wh where do we go from here? How do we all agree? Did somebody vote? Like, how does this, how do we decide what parts of the Bible are, are true and not? So this whole misunderstanding about slavery is, um, it has implications far beyond uh, just the issue of, of slavery and to just about every other issue because it calls into question how we view scripture. Uh, so just a few bits of clarification because it's a widely misunderstood uh, subject what the Bible does actually say on this. Anytime you get in a discussion, first of all, on the issue of slavery, you need to know there you're talking about three different types of slavery. Uh, first of all is what comes to our mind as 21st century Westerners when we hear the word slavery, and that is we think of New World African slavery, race-based um, chattel slavery from the New World. So that's what is most associated in our minds. Uh, and then in the Bible, though, you have two other types of slavery. One is Hebrew slavery, and, and then you have Roman slavery. Uh, and these are all very different types of slavery. That's why in some Bible translations, uh, Paul, when he's beginning his epistles, for example, will say, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. And he introduces him this way, as a slave of Christ Jesus. And, and I don't know about you, the first time I read that in the Bible, uh, when I was younger, I was like, a slave of Christ? That sounds harsh. And, you know, just uh, all the connotations with that of being whipped and this and that and sold on a boat. And I'm like, what? A slave of Christ? And then you read a, another translation, and it says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Ah, that makes so much more sense. Same word in the Greek, but one translated as slave one is uh, servant. Why, why is that? Well, why do they translate it differently? Okay, well, first of all, let's, let's start with Hebrew slavery. Um, Hebrew slavery, what is talked about there, very, very different from what we think of as New World slavery. The Jews were slaves. They were treated harshly by the Egyptians. Uh, slavery was normal. Slavery was everywhere. Slave, slavery existed without question. Slavery was as much a fact of everyday life as food and water and air and there was no society in the ancient Near East that did not have slavery and the Jews were a whole race of slaves kept in Egypt and they were treated very harshly. Uh, they were whipped, they were beaten, If they, their children were murdered. They, when they got too big they would just go through and kill, murder the baby boys and, and Moses who, who, who from whom we get the laws uh, in the Old Testament uh, of the first five books of the Bible his family was a family of, of slaves. So when they came out of Egypt, when they headed to the promised land, when they started their own nation, and they're making laws, they make the most humane laws anywhere in the ancient Near East regarding slavery. Why? Because because they were slaves and they didn't want to see people treated the way they were treated. Uh, so it was the most progressive laws anywhere in the land. Now, we caught slavery... It was nothing like what we know of slavery in the West. It, the way it worked was like this. If you were in debt, and let's say you went to university and collect, you collected a lot of debt, or you had credit cards and went into a lot of debt, and you couldn't pay it, what would you do? You'd go and sell yourself as a slave for a few years. And then your master, the guy you sold yourself to, would have to pay off that debt. Um, say you were in massive debt, you, you sold yourself as a slave for three years, and he would pay off the hundred grand or, or whatever it is. But for those three years, 
you were his slave. You did whatever he said to do. Now that didn't include violence. If you beat, it says if you beat a slave and you you know you you, you beat, you hit him in the eye or knock out a tooth or anything, automatically he goes free. You forfeit the rest of your service. So you could not get angry and violent and and hit your slave. Once again, we might not in modern day we might even call it slavery. We might call it a form of servant too. But but it was slavery because that person really did own you uh, for that time. But uh, it was by far the most humane system anywhere in the ancient uh, Near East because they had been slaves. And God said, uh, he, he spoke through Moses, that they were to be very different than the surrounding societies who, who bought and sold slaves with, uh, with great cruelty. And so that form of slavery is the main way that uh, the Hebrews practiced slavery. There was some different... Um, categories for sort of prisoners of war if you were being attacked and you capture slave that kind of had its own category but the main way slavery was practiced among the hebrews was that way you'd sell yourself and then for a set period of time and you'd leave with some money that you could go out and start your life over again the other thing was roman slavery now the romans were much crueler than the hebrews uh so the roman empire though was massive um so in rome Rich senators had slaves, and they would be sex slaves, and they would be, uh, you know, you could kill your slaves. I mean, the Romans could be harsh with their slaves. Um, but the Roman Empire was big, and so local customs and practices throughout the Roman Empire uh, played largely to how on the ground, outside of the Roman area, immediately the city of Rome, uh, it was practiced. So in Israel, even though it was part of the Roman Empire, um, the Jews, they... they by and large, would not have um, kept slaves in typical Roman uh, fashion. Um, th things varied. Um, so when Paul writes in the New Testament, uh, he's writing to people who are largely slaves. The early Christian movement was not a rich and powerful movement. Uh, they were a persecuted minority. They were largely poor, so more women than men, more slaves than slave owners. And so when Paul writes what he does in the context of, of slaves, obey your masters with a joyful heart. Um, he's not writing as a slave owner, talking to other slave owners. He's talking as a poor guy who keeps getting beat up to his brothers in Christ who happens to be slaves. And they say, Paul, uh, now that we're in this situation, now that we've become faith, how can we show Christ's love to people around us. And so he's telling, well, treat this person this way and this person this way. And for your master, uh, while you're serving him, um, do it with a joyful heart as, uh, as unto the Lord. Uh, and he gives him that instruction. And, but then he also says elsewhere, he says, but if you can get your freedom, and back then slaves could get their freedom, uh, try to do it. Back then, slavery was in Rome uh, as cruel as it was. It wasn't race-based. You wouldn't be able to tell if a person was slave was a slave coming down the street by the color of their skin or, or what they were wearing. Um, the only occasion with that would be prisoners of war from the north. So you might have a few blonde-haired, blue-eyed slaves from the war with the Goths uh, occasionally, but generally it was not race-based at all. And to the few Christian uh, slave owners, um, the, the few Christians who were rich and powerful, because Jesus does love rich people too, um, contrary to some popular opinion, he loves everybody. Uh, Paul says, listen, okay, it, now that you are a Christian, you must completely change the way you think about your slaves. They're, they're not just your property anymore. No, they belong to Jesus. Um, you must treat them as your brothers. You must not threaten them. You must not beat them. In other words, he was trying to reform um, not reform the system, but he was telling uh, Roman slave owners that you need to act a lot more like the Hebrew form of slavery in the Old Testament than what you know in popular culture through, um, through, uh, through Roman society. Well, Christianity grew for 300 years and the Roman Empire collapsed, but Christianity was still a strong and dynamic movement at the time, even though there's no more unifying political force throughout Rome. And, but there was Christianity, and it was becoming quite a dynamic movement all throughout Europe. But when the Roman Empire fell, Christian, Christian influence was so much that slavery as an institution uh, completely vanished. And for a thousand years, there was no slavery anywhere in Europe, just about. It was... It was gone. It was obliterated. There, uh, it didn't seem compatible with the the, the new and growing uh, Christian ethos. And so, for a thousand years, no no slavery. It's the longest time Europe had has ever gone without uh, slavery. It was after the collapse of the Roman Empire and the the ascendancy of of, of the Christian movement. 
A thousand years later, finally, when uh, African slavery was introduced, it was uh, introduced against very vocal opposition uh, from the papacy that um, slavery was something of the past of the Roman pagan days. It shouldn't be something brought into the modern uh, world. Uh, but money is money. And so a lot of rich, powerful merchants did that. And for a couple hundred years, Europe had slavery again, only it was a cruel, it wasn't anything like Hebrew slavery, it was a cruel, harsh, kidnapping slavery, the type that Paul actually condemns in the New Testament, and uh, I believe it's um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, where he talks about kidnapping, that word in the Greek for kidnapping, the very particular type, it was for people who would go and, and steal people and sell them into slavery, and that is condemned harshly in the New Testament, um, uh, without exception. Um, for without having to go to details, the, Mark Knoll, he's an Ivy League professor, um, I believe he's a professor of history at Notre Dame, uh, no, Notre Dame University in, uh, in the States. Uh, he's written a book, The Civil War as a Theological Crisis. If you really want to get into the details about that, uh, recommend that book. Um, he's a t world class uh, scholar and he dissects uh, exactly why it is the evangelicals of northern states and of Britain were the most vocal opponents to the slave trade, while some uh, Anglican churches and theologians in the South tried to be more accommodating and kind of mix um, Christian thought with slavery. And he, he kind of surveys the, the approach of the Bible time. Anyway, Huge details, you could spend an hour just talking about that. Um, so that that's how Christianity has, has engaged with uh, slavery. But the, for media today, you just wouldn't get it. Um, you, you wouldn't think it. You'd think that the Bible was something that actually supported slavery when it absolutely does not. Uh, I'll give you a, just to attend a brief example. A few years ago, the, the movie um, 12 Years a Slave, the life of Solomon Northup. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, so he was a, an educated, well-to-do black man, African-American, living in the northern states in the time when the southern states practiced uh, slavery. Uh, he was kidnapped and sold as a slave to the south for 12 years, uh, finally found his freedom, came back to the north, wrote a book all about his experience. While it was made into a movie, Brad Pitt was in it, and uh, a lot of big names, just a few years ago. Uh, in the movie, how do you think they portray the Bible? Um, and the, the, the Christian slave master. Well, of course, the, the same way that uh, just about all Hollywood spin-offs would. Um, you know, you have this cruel guy with a whip quoting verses that disobedient slaves will be beaming with many stripes, taking verses uh, kind of really out of context. Um, is that anywhere in the book? No, it's not at all. The, in fact, the exact opposite is in the book. Solomon, when he writes the book, he talks about, because he was traded around between different slave masters, he said, there was one slave master who did quote the Bible and who did read the Bible and he actually took his Christian faith very seriously, unlike the others who were kind of Christian in name because Europe was Christian society back then. But there's one guy who took his Christian faith seriously. He was the nicest guy. He'd come out and work with us and laugh with us. He never beat us or threatened us. He really tried to live like Jesus. And uh, really, I had so much respect for the guy. And, and you see this in the book. I, I have the book here on my Kindle. Um, yeah, I think it's like about a quarter of the way through the book. Um, uh, a complete opposite of what the stereotype is, of what um, people who try to take the, the Bible seriously on slavery. So uh, I hope that background gives uh, a little bit of perspective in dealing with this because when you talk about things other than slavery, other issues, and you're trying to really see what the Bible teaches on a specific issue, and then you're met with the whole oh, well, the Bible supports slavery. It says slavery is a good thing. and It, it can just really be defeating, if uh, not because you care about slavery. Obviously, we're, we're all glad that slavery is gone and finished and, and done with. Um, but uh, it can really be defeating your confidence of Scripture uh, if you don't really know the historical context of what Scripture actually does say, what it says as a whole, not one isolated verse, but throughout the whole. And... Uh, I, you can confidently say, hey, I agree 100% with everything the Bible says about slavery from Genesis to Revelation. I agree, I, I agree with everything the Bible says. I support it. And, and I support what the Bible says on other issues. And that's what I'm trying to learn and find out, tell you what it says. Okay, uh, this is Joshua Sandy's Cove. I know this has been a bit longer than usual. I hope you found it helpful. Later.